Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, so my name is Jason Bordoff. I'm a professor at the School of International Public Affairs, and I direct the Center on Global Energy Policy. Thanks to all of you for coming today to talk about the <clears throat> future of solar, which I think is an incredibly important and timely and relevant topic. It seems like every day there's another projection from some international or domestic agency that uh, we're going to be hydrocarbons, which are 80% of the mix today, will stay a very large percentage of the energy mix for decades to come. And then uh, another news item or headline that makes you think this disruption in an energy transition could happen much more quickly than we think. And the cost declines we've seen, as everyone here knows, in the cost of solar, not to mention wind and battery storage and everything else, makes us think that the outlook for the growth of renewables could be uh, much more rapid, and has been in the last several years more rapid than people thought. So the question is whether that's going to continue what it will take uh, to enable that to continue from a policy standpoint and a technology standpoint uh, and a market standpoint. So, um, so this, is, this book is fantastic in answering all of those questions. I don't, it's not just me who says that. It's the Financial Times and lots of other uh, uh, more influential reviewers who have really um, agreed. I mean, I agree with what they've said, which is it's a fantastic read, a very readable book, but one that is deeply uh, researched based on roughly a decade of work or more <clears throat> that Varun has spent studying uh, the solar industry. And uh, so really thrilled that this book is out uh, and that he's here today to talk about it. So um, Taming the Sun from MIT Press uh, is the name of it. Uh, Varun Sivaram uh, is uh, the author, a good friend who is um, uh, well known to, to many of you uh, he is a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations for Science and Technology, an adjunct senior research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia, uh, also an adjunct professor at Georgetown, and a member of the advisory boards for uh, the Stanford Woods Institute, and has all sorts of accolades, the top 30 under 30 leaders from many, many publications. His bio does not say that he was called by one author the Hamilton of the solar industry for being uh, a unique sort of polymath in his, uh, his background. Deep policy engagement, advising uh, cities, advising states, uh, on New York State and the mayor of Los Angeles, among others, on issues of energy policy, particularly around renewables, but also a deep and serious research background with a PhD in condensed matter physics, a Truman Scholar, a Rhodes Scholar, sort of pick the most prestigious accolades you can think of, and Varun has collected them at a remarkably young age. Uh, and so for me, I think with the mission of the Center on Global Energy Policy, which is to have the capability at one of the world's leading research universities to do first-rate, cutting-edge, analytic and rigorous work to understand how the energy system is changing, but then build the capability to help ensure that we can communicate that effectively to policymakers and industry leaders and people outside of academia. There are very few people who do both of those things as well uh, as Varun does. There are people who do one of those two things, very well, many people who do one of those two well, but it's, you don't always find people who are able to combine those things as effectively as Varun has. Uh, so it's been great to collaborate with him on things at Columbia and at CFR and uh, have this book come out now and have him here today to present it. Uh, let me first quickly say that this event, like all those at the center, is being webcast live. Uh, both the full video and podcast recording will be available on our website and on iTunes in the coming days. We'll hear uh, Varun present the book uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it, but I hope this won't take the place of reading it, and you'll go ahead and do that. Uh, and then we'll have a conversation, the two of us up here, and take questions from those in the room, and also those watching online will have the ability, as always at our events, to ask questions through uh, Twitter with the hashtag CGEP events and our Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy. So with that, please join me in welcoming to Columbia University, Dr. Varun Sivaram. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Um, you know, Jason has been for me a mentor and a role model just outside as we were walking up. I said, hey, Jason, how do I become you in 10 years? So, Jason, thank you for inviting me. I also think what you've done with the center is remarkable. Um, in five years, I think you've turned the center into, I don't, know, I don't know if anyone will dispute me, the best energy policy center in the country. So, congratulations. I'm thrilled to be here, um, and I thought since I took uh, a long train up to New York City, um, I'd tell you about my book through a video. <laughs> 
Did you know that the sun beams down more energy in an hour than the entire world uses in a year? As the world races to avert catastrophic climate change, the sun offers by far the most abundant source of clean energy. And by harnessing it, countries can also power economic growth, expand electricity access, and reduce energy imports. Over the last decade, solar has gone from expensive novelty to the cheapest, fastest growing power source on Earth. But here's the thing, we could squander its potential if we don't plan for the future. Today, solar supplies just 2% of the world's electricity. And even though it might look like solar power could keep on growing exponentially, its rise could very well hit a ceiling, flattening out in coming decades far before it unseats dominant fossil fuels. In Europe, we're already seeing the slowdown. And if that happens on a global scale, the solar revolution could sputter out. Preventing that is the point of my new book, Taming the Sun. I argue that three types of innovation are needed to unlock solar's full potential. The first innovation is financial. Right now, solar needs to attract trillions of dollars to fuel its rise. But so far, the world's most deep-pocketed investors have largely sat on the sidelines. So the solar industry needs to take a page out of the playbook from the fossil fuel, automobile, and mortgage industries and bundle together solar projects so big institutional investors feel comfortable buying and trading them. I'm pretty confident the industry will figure that one out. But just as soon as solar gets over that funding speed bump, it could run into a much more serious obstacle known as value deflation. See, all this investment will help the industry produce and deploy more solar panels, driving down the cost of building a new solar project. That's the good news. But the bad news is that the value of the electricity produced by solar will plunge even faster. As more solar panels come online, they'll flood the grid with power in the middle of the day, but shut off when the sun sets. Even though customers will need power during dinner time, the next solar panel will just feed them more lunchtime power. That's not very valuable. Soon, the value will fall below the cost, so it won't make economic sense to install any more solar panels. That will halt the momentum of solar's rise. Overcoming this barrier starts with technological innovation. Breakthroughs in solar technology could cause the cost of solar to plunge, enabling more solar to be deployed economically. Next generation technologies, such as perovskites, already exist in laboratories, and they could transform today's heavy, rigid, and frankly ugly solar panels into lightweight, flexible, and colorful coatings that tomorrow could cover cityscapes around the world. Additionally, developing advanced solar thermal plants could convert the sun's energy into heat and use that heat to generate power 24 seven rather than just at lunchtime. And one day, artificial leaf technology could even harness sunlight to make portable fuels, finally making oil obsolete. Still, even with these two types of innovation, solar will need a third to limit the decline of its value as more of it's deployed. And that would be systemic innovation which includes things like continent-spanning power grids that link sun-drenched deserts to power-hungry cities, energy markets that pay for energy storage and flexible generators to smooth out the volatile swings of solar power, and smart software that can turn electric vehicles into mobile batteries to resupply the grid once the sun goes down. These innovative energy systems would preserve solar's value by making sure that solar power can be used no matter when it's produced, or how it fluctuates. Promoting all three kinds of innovation will require urgent investments by governments all around the world. And that needs to start right now. If we wait until solar runs out of steam, it'll be too late to get it back on track. But if we get this right, the 21st century will finally be the one in which humankind secures cheap, clean, and virtually limitless energy, all by taming the sun. I wanted to show you that video um, to give you a brief overview of what the book talks about. Um, what I'd now love to do is walk you through some of the data behind it. Because I hear, Jason, you draw a pretty wonky energy crowd. <laughs> so, so I would love to, to throw some graphs at you guys um, and walk through exactly why I think solar energy could hit a wall uh, and what we're going to do about it. Okay, thanks so much. Um, a little bit about me. I, I grew up in Silicon Valley, um, and in Silicon Valley, we think a lot more about ooh, that's that's reverberating. <laughs> we think a lot more about this bottom curve here um, 
the, what's called Moore's Law, the cost declines of memory microchips. And in comparison with solar, the cost of microchips has fallen precipitously. <coughs> but if you're sitting in the energy industry, you see the cost of solar in that top graph falling quite fast compared to, say, uh, the cost of retail electricity, which really hasn't budged uh, in you know, several decades. So the point of the slide is to say that where you stand depends on where you sit. I came from Silicon Valley. I happen to believe that innovation has the power to revolutionize systems, whether they are semiconductor systems or energy systems. But if you sit in the energy industry, you may well think, hey, it's really hard to change these systems. And now that I've had some experience in both, both in technology uh, sectors as well as uh, in the energy space, um, I wanted to write the book to provide this even-handed take on what's feasible and what's not. And I really do think that investing in innovation is worth it uh, when it comes to solar energy. So let me tell you about the, the book structure. I will try not to give too much away because I hope at the end of this you'll go right outside and buy your own copy. <laughs> um, the book's got four parts. The first part sets out, it sets the stage, and the remaining three parts lay out the three kinds of innovation I mentioned, financial, technological, and systemic. So in the first <coughs> part, I argue, look, solar is the most abundant energy resource the world has. These cubes are telling you that more energy hits the Earth in an hour than the world uses in a year, blah, 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 right? And the, the logical uh, rejoinder is, Yes, but it's really hard and inconvenient to harness this intermittent power source. That's why the book's called Taming the Sun. The sun is to unreliable uh, and, and not very uh, amenable uh, to being harnessed. That's why we've tried for 3,000 years to do this. And in the book, I walk through that 3,000 year history. But just recently, solar started to take off. You can see in that right-hand chart, solar, just over the last decade, has taken off and now accounts for about 2% of global electricity. The problem, however, is that we may have seen this movie before. On the left chart, you see the rise and fall of nuclear energy. Nuclear was once the next great hope for you know, clean, abundant, ubiquitous energy for all. And yet, in the 1990s, nuclear hit this peak at nearly 20% of world electricity and has declined ever since. You may not think that nuclear and solar have very much to do with each other, but I think that underlying the nuclear stagnation is a similar phenomenon that could afflict solar, something I call technological lock-in, the use of an inferior first-generation technology that gets so dominant that it prevents the second-generation technology from breaking in. In the case of nuclear, that was the nuclear light water reactor that today accounts for over 90% of nuclear reactors. In the case of solar, it may very well be the silicon solar panel that's become the dominant technology and has built a moat around itself that other technologies will struggle to cross. That's not to discount, however, the remarkable gains that have been made in silicon solar. You know, silicon solar, it's that uh, the blue line, because I haven't figured out how to use this laser pointer, I'll point like this. The blue line is telling you how silicon solar cells have improved <coughs> over the last four decades. They've gotten a lot better. That red line, though, that's perovskites. And I'm so excited because that red line is as steep as it is. It's faster than any other solar technology we have ever seen. But silicon is today's dominant technology, and there's a reason for that. It's because China managed to drive down the cost of manufacturing silicon solar panels. And in addition to supporting manufacturers of solar and turning China into the world's largest producer, China's also supported the deployment of solar. China today is the world's largest market for solar, accounting for about a majority of all solar deployment all over the world. So China, single-handedly, in concert with this single technology, silicon, has become this dominant behemoth. And that's where we stand today. That's why solar is the cheapest, fastest growing electricity source on the planet and attracted $160 billion in investment last year. Around the world, you see remarkably low costs of solar. At least these are the quoted costs for power purchase agreement contracts. Some of these costs are around two cents per kilowatt hour. That's crazy low. We, a decade ago, we would never have thought this would have been possible. Um, there are various reasons to think that it may not actually be as low as two cents. There may be cheap financing or embedded subsidies. But the point is, 
solar around the world has gotten remarkably cheap. And so we should all be excited. Bloomberg certainly is. They project that solar will keep growing in this hockey stick-like trajectory. And between India, China, and the Middle East driving half of solar growth, by 2040, we're going to see solar hit 15% of global electricity. And by 2050, solar may well be on its way to the target I set, which is 33% of global electricity. It sounds like we're on the right track, right? The problem, as I laid out in the video, is that in fact, there's this value deflation problem. Solar tends to cannibalize its own value if you put more of it on a grid. It's a victim of its own success. So here's a Nature Energy paper that I and, some collab and, a, and a collaborator at GTM Research wrote. Uh, we studied three different markets, California, Germany, and Texas. And we looked at the available literature and we found that, in fact, at 15% of a grid's electricity coming from solar, the value of that solar electricity falls by half. At 30%, which is the global target I'm setting, the value of that solar falls by 70%. What that means is if solar is cost competitive today, which it is in many parts of the world, from Abu Dhabi to Chile to China, it may not be when you have a lot more solar on the grid. It's cost competitiveness is a function of how much you have. And so we may be complacent today saying solar is doing just fine. But if solar hits that wall because there's a lot of it and it's no longer very valuable and we haven't made investments in innovation, it will probably be too late. Here's an example to show you why that value deflation is occurring. This is California last year. It looks a lot like California this year in March. You see in the middle of the day on the top graph, solar is accounting for about 50% of the state's electricity demand. As a result, in the bottom graph, the price of power is negative. The market's paying you to shut off your power plant because there's too much power at lunchtime. But then the power price spikes at 5 p.m. and that's because the sun's setting and solar is getting wiped off the grid. The idea here is that in California, where you have a little over 10% of your electricity coming from solar, you already have economics that are no longer favorable for solar energy. How are we gonna get to 33%? Well, in California, we've had this much growth because of mandates and we'll continue to have solar growth. But mandates cannot enable us to cost-effectively provide clean energy to the entire world. And so California is a valuable example to show us that when you take the mandates away, and by the way, right now we're in this, we're in this, school. no, I didn't figure that. Mm -hmm. We're in this phase where um, the mandate is actually not constraining between 2018 and 2020. So the, the pace of solar deployment has halted because the underlying economics are not very good. California demonstrates to us that value deflation is a real problem. And that in order to uh, continue solar's rise, we're going to need two things. Solar's got to get cheaper a lot faster, and its value's got to stop falling. <clears throat> I'll talk about both of those. But first, we've got a pretty good technology today. And for the next decade, I think it's got legs. What are we going to do to get this deployed? Because today's existing investors, this is a complicated graph, I'll explain it. Today's existing investors don't have the capital to invest the trillions of dollars solar needs to keep growing. Bloomberg projects a $2.5 trillion shortfall in financing for solar through 2040 if it's going to continue its hockey stick trajectory. To plug that $2.5 trillion gap, we're going to need the world's biggest investors, institutional investors, as I mentioned in the video. And those investors are not comfortable investing in individual projects. They don't want to be taking their team, their limited resources, and doing due diligence on a single solar project that they then <coughs> have liquidity risk on. No, they want to be able to buy and sell securities on public capital markets. That's why in the bottom graph, you see how the shortfall is plugged by a variety of different public capital market vehicles. A yield co is one of them, modeled after the way the oil and gas industry funds its projects, its oil pipelines, for example, through MLP vehicles. These vehicles pool together diversified portfolios of solar assets and enable investors to trade them in a way they're comfortable with. They like publicly tradable securities. Similarly, the auto and mortgage industries use asset-backed securities to source debt capital in their sectors. I think the solar industry can do so as well. And in the case of the solar industry, we've already seen over a billion dollars in solar securitization just last year. So I think the solar industry is learning the lessons of these other sectors and deploying financial innovations to source more capital. I'm actually quite optimistic that financial innovation is going to give us a glide path for the next decade or so.
in addition to the developed world, I think the developing world stands to gain. You know, around the world, a billion people lack access, over a billion people lack access to reliable electricity. They're concentrated in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. But new business models are bringing solar to folks who have never had electricity. This is one of them. The pay-as-you-go business model. The schematic here tells you that a startup, can, you know, many startups actually have gone to East Africa, for example, and they've set up solar home systems in villages that have never had access to electricity, or community microgrids that network together a collection of homes. And they install it largely with no money up front, no money down. The customer then pays on a monthly basis using mobile money, because mobile money has started to take off in countries like Kenya. The company is able to front that capital, pay for that system, by accessing public capital markets. That's ongoing. They're trying to figure out how to do it, but I'm confident they will figure that out. And then down the road, the remarkable thing is that the customer can pay off the entire cost of the asset through monthly payments, and then own a valuable solar asset. And that gives them an asset to then raise credit against. That's why there's a picture of the credit card. This is such an economically empowered concept. So that's a business model innovation that's bringing electrification to the developing world. Still, so, oh, uh, sorry, one more thing. Um, I do want to say that in, in tandem with business model innovations, you do see hardware cost declines. A remarkable decline has been seen in the cost of appliances, energy efficient televisions, radios, um, lights, LEDs. They've fallen in cost faster even than the quick declines in cost of solar panels and batteries. And so I think governments can help. In lo largely in this first bucket, financial innovation, I'm pretty confident the private sector will figure things out, but I think governments can help. And here's one way they can help. In places like Nigeria, where the goal is to electrify the entire country in the next decade, the government isn't going to be able to extend the grid to every single citizen. It should prioritize the areas where it can extend the grid and then give some investment certainty to those off-grid electric providers, the providers of microgrids, the providers of solar home systems, to say, hey, we're not going to extend the grid to these hard-to-reach remote locations. You guys go ahead and serve those communities. And we'll give you a license to operate. This is a mapping effort that's been done to identify areas that are most cost-effectively cost effectively reached with the central grid, or with microgrids, or with solar home systems. And that's how the government can provide a coherent national strategy toward achieving a target that otherwise would have been impossible, national uh, full electrification. Still, we will hit technology limits, and that's why the third part of my book is about technological innovation. I talked about this cool technology, perovskites. With perovskites, and we made this in our lab. We can make them any color you want. Uh, th these devices were made in Oxford. Um, any color you want, any level of transparency, we can make them flexible. Look, we're, we're bending this thing, it still works. Um, and in addition, it's made from dirt cheap, abundant elements, and we can make it more efficient than silicon. You saw that graph. Perovskite could beat silicon on every single performance metric, and yet, I'm not confident it's going to get out of the lab because I worry sincerely about this technology lock-in problem. Now, here's a way that I think we might solve that technology lock-in problem. Instead of a perovskite startup going head-to-head -head with a silicon behemoth, what if the, the perovskite startup piggybacked on the silicon solar panel? This is a figure from a, a piece that um, uh, some of my collaborators and I wrote in Scientific American. This is a diagram of a silicon solar panel, the green layer, with the perovskite layer, the orange layer, right on top of it. And if you look at this figure in the bottom left-hand uh, corner, you see that of the solar spectrum, the silicon green layer absorbs some of the light, the infrared wavelengths, the red wavelengths, and the perovskite layer absorbs some other parts of the light uh, spectrum, the blue wavelengths, the ultraviolet wavelengths. And by combining these two technologies, you can make a more efficient solar panel than what you already have. That's a great way to go to market, because your product kind of looks the same as an existing silicon panel. It just works better. It's more efficient. And down the road, when you have manufacturing scale to make your perovskites, well, down the road, you could then make a standalone perovskite product. I think, I'm really going to have to point that stuff. Um, I think that today's emerging technologies are here at 10 and 15 percent. Quantum dot cells, organic cells, perovskites 
or up at 22%. But down the road, I really think we could get solar panels or coatings at 35% efficiency. First, if we layer perovskites on top of silicon, and then we have perovskite-only devices that have a super high theoretical ceiling on their efficiency. We could see better panels in 2050, but only if we invest in the requisite innovation. Finally, I'll mention that in addition to photovoltaics, that's the conversion of sunlight into electricity, we could also have the conversion of sunlight into portable fuels. Artificial leaf technology that I mentioned is one way to do this. You harness the sun's energy to split water and produce hydrogen. Hydrogen is then a useful energy carrier. It can fuel a car. It can even be a feedstock into other industrial processes where you take carbon dioxide captured from a smokestack, you combine it with hydrogen, and now you have an oil replacement, a petroleum replacement. That can also fuel vehicles, or it can power industry. So there are a range of things that, uh, you know, I, I envision solar refineries replacing oil refineries in the distant future, if we can get this artificial leaf technology to work. And in my book, I argue that, in fact, there are already promising technologies out there. Unfortunately, they're about as big as my fingernail. So finally, I talk about putting it all together. Systemic innovation. This is all about productively using this super inconvenient source of energy, intermittent solar power. Can we productively use it no matter when it's produced or how much it fluctuates? Well, one way to do this is to make your grids really, really big. China wants to build a global supergrid. It's probably not going to happen. But regional supergrids, if you just look at the color coding, regional supergrids actually could happen. In North America, I think it's a fantastic idea for us to have a North American supergrid. Hey, it could even have geopolitical uh, benefits if it helps the United States and Mexico repair their frayed relationship. In addition, uh, you know, they're talking about supergrids in Europe. Uh, there's one under consideration that would connect Japan, China, and South Korea. These grids make it easier to match areas with an excess of renewable energy with those with high demand and aggregate intermittent and volatile supply and demand over a large area that smooths it out. Now you might think, hey, why are we even talking about this stuff? The most intuitive solution is just batteries, right? The cost of batteries has fallen a lot. Look at these lithium iron batteries. They've fallen, this, they've fallen the same cost trajectory as so silicon solar panels. The problem is, some colleagues and I at MIT uh, have modeled what batteries can do to increase the penetration of solar. It turns out they can't do that much. Look, batteries are useful for storing up to, say, four hours of electricity from solar panels. But solar electricity needs to be stored not just in minutes and hours, but also over days and weeks and months and seasons. Lithium-ion batteries can't be economically deployed to do that. We can't deploy even a fraction of the amount of storage we need in the form of lithium-ion batteries. This graph is showing you that if you had super cheap solar, 25 cents a watt, four times cheaper than today, and you had super, super cheap storage, $150 per kilowatt hour fully installed, you still would have a majority of your electri uh, electricity coming from non-solar sources, mostly from natural gas, actually. That's what we found by simulating the Texas grid and looking for the lowest cost set of resources. So if you care about affordability and you also care about decarbonization, you'll understand that batteries plus solar is not a panacea. We can get into the systemic stuff more, but I think I'm over time, so I want to end with this slide. <clears throat> it will take considerable funding for energy innovation from the United States <coughs> as a leader if we're going to make uh, these requisite leaps. The United States committed in 2015 under President Obama to mission innovation, to doubling its research development and demonstration funding, and leading a group of 20 nations to do the same. Now, we just heard over the weekend that President Trump signed into law, remarkably, a package of spending legislation that would actually increase uh, funding for energy innovation. Solar PV funding went up 33%. This is awesome. So we might actually be on track a few years late to meet our commitment to double research and development funding, and that would be fantastic. Because if we don't, look at this graph. China is on track to surpass the United States' funding by 2020. This is a policy imperative, and I hope you will check out the book uh, for many more policy recommendations. And <laughs> this is a shameless plug. So <laughs> uh, that's all I've got. I'm super excited for Jason to interrogate me. I know he will. Um, and thank you all for taking the time to listen to me. I really appreciate it.
Thanks. Uh, well, we have plenty of time for discussion and uh, a lot of uh, folks in the room. So uh, I'll just get it started, I guess. There's, um, talk a little bit about the reaction to your book, which has uh, been both positive and negative. There are some solar advocates, Jigger Shah and others, who've been pretty critical of it and, and criticized you for almost being like anti-clean energy, like undermining the future of solar. Um, What's your response to them, and, and, and where do you acknowledge they may have a point? Like, what, what's the best argument for why you might be wrong? Um, that's a good one. <laughs> Ask me to beat myself. So, Jigger and I were sitting at a panel at the Atlantic Council, you know, about as far as you and I are. And I say, you know, Jigger, you've been great for the field. You've done a lot of financial innovation. He goes, thanks for me. Your argument's really insidious. <laughs> insidious. Um, I didn't know I could do that. Uh, and, 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 and frankly, I think what he did was make a straw man out of my argument. You know, he said, your argument's insidious because it tells policymakers we don't have the tools we need in order to take action right now. And I think we've got a great technology. Silicon solar has become remarkably cheap. I, I want to use financial innovation to impact <coughs> trillions of dollars and deploy a lot of it. But I also think we should be eyes wide open about the possibility that we may not have everything we need and that we may hit a wall and we ought to be investing in innovation. We can do that in parallel with deploying today's technology. I personally think that Jigger is treating policymakers as far too simple-minded. We don't have to just you know, spoon-feed them one message. You've got what you need, go act. I think we can spoon-feed them, uh, so sorry, I think we can give them a, 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 a tiered message, which is you've got a good thing now, but continue to invest in the next thing because it may very well be needed a decade or two down the road. I think a lot of folks, look, in January and, and now um, after the launch in March, I got a ton of criticism. And it's mostly by people who are just super confused about what on earth I'm saying. <laughs> they say, here's this guy. He claims to be a solar advocate, but he's criticizing solar. How can that be possible? And I personally believe that we absolutely need to criticize solar in order for it to get better. Um, we cannot be complacent if we just rest on our laurels after the gains that have been made over the last decade, which are remarkable, don't get me wrong. Solar will help keep this wall, and the, the world doesn't get a second chance. So there, I mean, there, there is uh, a strong, there are many who think that with existing technologies, we can scale up to 100% renewables um, pretty quickly. And uh, there's a whole academic debate among some people on the left and, and some political leaders who kind of picked up on that, say we can, uh, when it comes to fossil fuels, keep it in the ground because renewables can handle the load right now. How do you respond to that? You know, I, I woke up one day, uh, and I was in India, so the time zones are kind of messed up. I wake up, and I see my, my Twitter blew up. Oh, man, the Incredible Hulk tweeted me. This is awesome. And then, oh, man, the Incredible Hulk said that I'm a fossil fuel chill. And, and, and the reason was because uh, I and 20 other co-authors wrote this paper saying it's a 100% renewable movement led by a particular academic at Stanford uh, really doesn't have an academic basis that... Uh, going to 100% renewable energy is not cost effective. Uh, we probably should not be setting that as the target. Uh, what we should be setting is the lowest cost target for decarbonizing the electricity system. And doing it with 100% renewable turns out to be hugely expensive, complicated, and likely very unpopular. So I look at folks who, who argue that we could go 100% renewable and say, why would you, we have a tough enough task the task is to decarbonize a sector that largely relies on fossil fuels. On top of this tough task, why don't you tie a hand behind your back and say, we're not going to use nuclear energy, we're probably not going to use carbon capture and sequestration. That, that seems like you're shooting yourself in the foot and you've only got one foot. Um, so to the folks who say, I'm setting back progress toward uh, this target of 100% renewable, I say that was a terrible target to begin with. Um, but there's plenty of good work that can be done. Just to get to 60% renewables, I think we're going to have to build out a nationwide high voltage direct current transmission network, right? And and and, and you know, just to get there and, and to keep the United States as carbon emissions falling, we're going to have to make sure we don't shut down our nuclear plant. We're going to have to make sure that we invest in new nuclear technologies uh, and make sure that we we surround solar and wind with flexible sources of generation that can ramp up and down and are also low carbon. There's so much work to be done. Let's not get hung up over this 100% goal. Um, what does that do with the Incredible Hulk? The Incredible Hulk supports the research from... Which Incredible Hulk? Uh, uh, Mark Ruffalo. 
Oh, oh, look at that one. Okay. I, I, I'm dating myself. I was like, Lou Ferrigno supports, uh, the, like, what? what? Um, that's a prior Incredible Hulk. Uh, the, uh, and, and so one, I mean, you mentioned a high-voltage transmission grid. Uh, one of the concern, questions I've heard raised about your argument that the economics of solar get worse as solar scales is that it doesn't account for improvements in storage and investments in long-distance transmission. What's your response? So I think that a portfolio approach is needed to prevent value deflation from halting solar. This portfolio approach of make solar cheaper and also make solar's value fall less slowly. So the things you mentioned are in the bucket of make solar's value fall less slowly. So if we build out a large transmission grid and we install a bunch of storage, and on top of that, we make demand much more responsive. That means that customers can respond to price signals, use their smart equipment, and <coughs> ramp up and down their space heaters, their water heaters, et cetera, uh, in response to when there's an excess of electricity or a deficit. Well, yeah, it, it, if you have a lot more solar, its value won't fall as quickly because that energy can be productively mm -hmm. used because it's been time shifted or it's been stored. So in a sense, I agree with your point. I think that if we do all those things, we will arrest the declining value of solar. However, it turns out that you can't just do those things. I also think you want to invest in solar technology innovation. The reason is uh, one good study from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory studied what would happen if storage was super cheap and humans behaved like robots. They responded very robotically to dynamic price signals. How much would that arrest value deflation? It turns out that it would mitigate less than half of the value deflation. So that's storage and flexible demand. On top of that, let's add transmission. Maybe you could mitigate a majority of the value deflation. But if you really want to eradicate value deflation and make sure solar stays economical no matter how much of it is deployed, I think you want not only to do storage, transmission, flexible demand, you also want the cost of solar to just plummet. And I like these new technologies for enabling that. Now, a lot of solar plant owners uh, sign long-term contracts for their power at locked-in prices. So what, what, why are we, what's the risk of... Uh, solar value deflation there if they're not exposed to wholesale market prices. That's a great point. Um, you, know, you know, today's solar uh, plant owners look at the market and laugh. They say, ha ha, um, those poor other plants, the natural gas plants, they're getting negative prices in the middle of the day, but, but I signed a contract with the utility and you know, the, the utility has to pay me for every kilowatt hour. Uh, so the first problem is in many of those contracts, um, you're guaranteed your rate up to a certain number of hours, and then after that certain number of hours, if you produce and the utility says, I don't need it, I'm going to curtail you or throw away your power, you don't get paid. The second thing is, you're right, the existing owners of solar plants in frontier zones like California that have deployed a lot thanks to mandates and subsidies, those plant owners may be very happy. But in the future, as value deflation takes root in markets around the world, I don't think jurisdictions are going to be able to afford the sorts of mandates that enable these solar owners to go and procure these long-term PPAs for preferential prices when utilities or off-takers understand that, oh my god, the price is going to plummet. I can't afford the contract for this long-term mm -hmm. uh, power purchase agreement. So in the long run, I don't think we can mask value deflation, which is what these contracts do. They mask it. The underlying economic truth is that solar becomes less valuable the more of it you have. And the market structure can mask it in the near term. Mandates can mask it. Once you get out from that mask, um, the, the truth of the matter is uh, we really need these innovations to, to stop the, the underlying value of things. I think when we talk about solar in the broader public conversation, there often, many, many, many cases, seems to be um, people, people <laughs> equate solar with distributed. And there's almost like an in assumption that there's inherent value in distributed. And there's something better about distributed. Um, and, but that's not actually where you see some of the best economics and, and some of, and, and more of the investment. So how do you think about whether the future is going to be centralized or distributed and does it does it matter if, if, if we just mean we get more solar wherever it comes from? Yeah, so I'll, I'll say first that highly decentralized solar, solar on your rooftop, probably not a great idea. At, at least right now, it's, it's, it's not a very economical idea. It can often impose more costs than the benefits it brings. And that's because you know you have to customize your solar installation on a rooftop. Um, the economics are far worse than if you got some economy of scale and built a larger installation. I do think, though, that there is a sweet spot 
It's somewhere in between super centralized installations that have the lowest unit cost but require high cost transmission to get mm -hmm. that energy to the demand center. There's a sweet spot in between super big things in the desert and super decentralized things on the rooftop. The sweet spot in the middle is what I call megawatt scale solar plants that are, <coughs> you know, they serve hundreds of households or thousands of households. Uh, and those solar plants can be built uh, near a substation. So you don't actually have to invest much in grid infrastructure to get that power to market. But you get to harness the economy of scale of building a large enough installation. So I think the future is um, somewhere between centralized and decentralized. But importantly, in my opinion, the most important consideration is how do we decarbonize at the lowest cost? And I actually, you've said this, Jason. You've said your figure of merit is dollars per ton of CO2 abated. And I think that's a great metric. Um, and if you're looking at that metric, you care less about, oh, I really like distributed solar because it empowers customers. Like, maybe, maybe not. What I really care about is how do I most cheaply decarbonize my electricity system? That's probably not what the most decentralized mm -hmm. the, um, the uh, I'm curious, when, when, again, when we talk about solar, we seem to usually talk about PV cells. The other way to use solar is for mirrors to heat up a lot of water and, and create steam that turns a turbine. What, what's, what, what's, is concentrated solar power going to play a big role? I'm really glad about that. I, I've forgotten my presentation, but, but there is a chapter in this. Um, I think that concentrated solar power is super important for a couple of reasons. Um, first, uh, it comes with built-in storage. Um, so if PV, which is converting sunlight instantaneously into electricity, is inconvenient because it fluctuates, CSP, concentrated solar power, comes with built-in storage because you can store the heat using thermal storage and generate electricity 24-7. So immediately, I think as value deflation takes root, CSP will become much more attractive. As the value of storage increases, this resource that comes with built-in storage is far more useful. I also think that there is this opportunity for innovation in CSP in addition to the heat. Uh, CSP systems, uh, have, you know, they can store electricity close to 24-7 now, but they could actually store it for longer and do it cheaper if we use higher temperatures. So if we heat the sun's energy up using concentrated mirrors to higher temperatures than what we can currently do, which is about 550 degrees Celsius. That's where the molten salts that we use mm -hmm. to store the, right. the heat, that's where they start to break down. And so what we really want to do is come up with, for example, uh, new molten salts, uh, mm -hmm. new phase change materials, uh, in order to store this energy at a higher temperature. Mm -hmm. We even want to change from using steam. You mentioned steam mm -hmm. as your working steam. You want to change from using steam to super critical carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. That actually could enable a much more efficient braiding cycle uh, generator. So all kinds of cool like tech innovation for concentrated solar power as well as for heat. And what do you see happening out there mm -hmm. in terms of how much of this innovation is happening, where capital is being deployed? Um, and, and how dependent is that when it comes to policy and, and now on, on government policy? We actually saw um, uh, our energy R&D protected in the budget recently, maybe more than, than some people feared. Um, how necessary is that going to be? Yeah, this, this is a great segue to policy because, you know, you see the financial markets chasing you know, the, the next hot thing. Um, look, I'm, I'm going to pick on a friend in the audience. Henry, I know you're on the trading desk and, you know, you may very well be chasing the thing that looks hot. Maybe you're a smarter trader, so you're chasing the thing that'll look hot next year. But what we really are worried about here is what's going to happen 10 years from now if solar hits a wall. Concentrated solar power, as an example, is not very hot. No pun intended. But it gets hotter. And it's not hot because the economics don't make sense uh, compared to PV on a levelized cost of electricity basis today because storage is not that valuable. Ten years from now, it will be very valuable. But if the financial markets aren't investing in CSP, and they're really not, well, that may make it the domain of policymakers to have a more far-sighted approach. Not far-sighted like you need glasses, like far-sighted like you're looking ahead into the future. I think uh, policymakers have a responsibility to invest in uh, the next generation of technology and guide private investors to do the same. I think private investors are emboldened when they see a public sector entity <coughs> demonstrate the first of a kind facility or investing in applied technology development or teaching them how to manufacture a particular product. Um, I was thrilled that the omnibus bill from Congress mm -hmm. increased funding for research and development. This is, you know, 
No thanks to the administration's efforts to gut uh, energy research and development. I was thrilled that Republicans in Congress stood up and said, absolutely not. We like institutions uh, like RPG. Um, and I think it's going to take you know, uh, such Republican leadership going forward to continue these things. But there are obviously many other ways in which this administration has signaled that some of the policies in support of climate action or clean energy from the past it seeks to reverse. How much of an impact do you think that's going to have on the outlook for solar? Yeah, look, this administration is trying its best to put a damper on the solar market. You all saw the, the solar tariffs. Jason was kind enough to invite me to write a post for, <laughs> for Columbia. Um, and, and, uh, Do you think that was motivated by hostility towards solar or, or, or by concerns about the trade practices of China and some of the subsequent actions we've seen to try to get tougher on trade with China? I think the, the latter. Th this was not a solar issue. This was the Trump administration saying, I want to poke China in the eye. I'm going to pick an industry to do it. Uh, I don't really like solar, so I'll pick that industry. It was not at all. It was not at all about, let's bring manufacturing back to the United States, which was the stated reason for passing these tariffs on solar panels. There's not a chance that happens, because as another paper that came out of Columbia shows by Shail Khan, um, the tariffs expired in four years, and they ramped down over those four years. And so next year, it will be uneconomical to build a factory here in the United States compared to importing from Southeast Asia, even with the tariffs. So it doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't help manufacturers. It certainly doesn't help the deployment of solar. You know, we'll see a 10 to 15 percent drop in installed solar over the next five years compared to if there were no tariffs. So I wrote in my piece for Columbia, I said, this is not your traditional tariff policy where the government says, oh my god, there's a politically powerful industry. I better listen to them. This is not regulatory capture by an industry. I said it was regulatory capture to an ideology, America first ideology, and a desire to poke China in the eye. <laughs> There's been a lot more posts since. Let's see what happens. And and the, uh, the uh, I was going to ask about um, what impact. Um, well, let me let me come back to that. Uh, so I, I want to. What are some of the most exciting financial innovations that you've seen in this space so far? You know, I. I mentioned a little bit about you know, these vehicles that you can trade publicly, I mentioned securitization. One thing I didn't mention that I was super excited about, um, most recently, a firm that amasses data related to solar has managed to turn this data into a very valuable asset to make it easier for investors to invest in this unfamiliar asset class. If you're an institutional investor, you know auto loans. You, you get the mortgage industry. You don't really get the solar industry. But what if some purveyor of data, and the one I'm talking about is kilowatt hour analytics, what if some purveyor of data says, hey, I can tell you with confidence that solar panels tend to produce this amount of electricity over the course of a year, and I have hundreds of thousands of data points to tell you that this is the case. Well, what they've managed to do is convince a large insurance company to back the production of a distributed uh, series of solar assets. And as a result, investors are way more confident investing in that. That drives down the cost of capital. Because now that the insurance company is saying, I'll step in and backstop in case the solar panels don't produce what you expect them to, the investors say, Great, I'm happy to provide debt capital, for example, at a lower cost of capital. This is an example of harnessing data and data science to lower the cost of capital and deploy solar faster than ever before. Data has been used in other industries. I think it's high time to use in the solar. And the sorry, just to, I, want, I want to make sure clarify something you said a minute ago on the, the impact of these tariffs on on solar deployment in the U.S. Uh, you, you've written about that, but just make sure everyone knows your sort of view on how how bad will that be for the outlook for solar growth in the U.S. Look, it's it, it's not terrible, but it's also not great. You know, it's <coughs> solar will basically do this slow increases without the tariffs. Solar would have done that. Um, 10, per, 10 to 15 percent more solar would have been deployed over the next five years, and that's because the tariffs raised the cost of solar panels here. As you guys know, 80 percent of the jobs in solar, in the solar industry, are in the deployment and installation of solar. Solar panel installer is the fastest growing job category in the United States. So we will definitely destroy more jobs than we create with these tariffs. And one thing I didn't even mention will actually hurt innovation. You and I both know. Um, uh, Tom Werner of SunPower, who warned that you know, he, here is an American company, one of the top two funders of research and development in the corporate side in solar, 
And he manufactures in Southeast Asia and brings the panels back in. And he says, look, these tariffs are going to hurt my ability to invest in my research and development facility in Silicon Valley. Because that's the first thing I cut that doesn't affect my quarterly earnings. Right? Which is what you know Henry keeps him on task for. And, and, and so as a result, if he's cutting the most near-term cash flow item that happens to be research and development, the tariffs are actually going to hurt innovation. And I think that's a, that's a terrible and unintended consequence of these tariffs. Is not only will they destroy jobs, they won't bring back manufacturing, they will slow the deployment of solar panels, they also will hurt innovation. And that's the one thing the United States can do. So, well, let me just push back for a second on that. So, that argument presumably would apply to, it's not just solar, anytime another country would subsidize any good in order to uh, boost domestic manufacturing and undermine manufacturers elsewhere, that also has the effect of making it cheaper for us to import those things. Um, but there's a reason that the World Trade Organization and, and the GATT laws within that don't allow company countries to do that. So you might say, it's great, we're getting cheap. If they want to subsidize the cost of our solar panels, it means cheaper solar for all of us. Like, why don't we celebrate that? Um, but there's a reason that countries worry about that. There's a reason that the Obama administration took action against Chinese subsidies on solar. There's a reason the International Trade Commission ruled against China before Trump took this action. So is there like, is there actually an argument that China is engaging in unfair trade practices that justify a response? The first thing is right. China is engaging in unfair trade practices. I completely agree with you. Look, uh, here's the problem. China engaged in unfair trade practices, in this case, a decade ago. And then President Obama levied tariffs, and then another round of tariffs. And now we're doing the third round of tariffs. And at this point, we are locking the closed barn door after the horse is bolted. It's no longer the case that our punitive action has anything to do with uh, stopping some behavior, because that behavior stopped a long time ago. Today's solar manufacturers are able to produce low-cost solar panels with or without green support. Um, so I, I completely agree with you. A decade ago, it would have been a really good idea to do something about uh, China's you know, government subsidies towards its manufacturers. And that was unfair, and I, I'm entirely on board. Today's policy, though, makes no sense. Um, it's not going to change their behavior, in my opinion. This poking guy doesn't change their behavior. And if what we really want to do is support our own crop of innovative companies, there's a much better way to do it than this blunt, across-the-board instrument that hurts 80% of the jobs that are in the deployment of solar. I think the much better way that we do this is through a targeted portfolio of innovation investments. And yeah, maybe it's the case that if we, you know, if, if we have some startups, they have a new technology, a prospect, for example. Maybe it's the case that we need to protect them. But we can do targeted protection. We don't need to subject the entire American solar market uh, to these damaging tariffs, uh, we can instead provide a beachhead, mm -hmm. perhaps through government procurement, for these emerging technologies to have an initial market. So let me ask you a last question, then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, we have a microphone here. Will people stand, or are we going to pass that around? Or, OK. Um, so one of the things you're working on now, mm -hmm. related, but a different topic, is the role of uh, data sciences and digital innovation, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Uh, talk a little bit about how that can help the uh, increase the use of renewable energy, if, if it can. It absolutely can. This is super important. Look, energy innovation is normally a doom and gloom story. It's like, man, all the solar companies went bankrupt. Or, man, like, we just need to increase energy innovation so they're going to do it. Like, it is really a depressing set of issues, and, and it requires a lot of like banging the head against the wall. But one area that's actually been remarkably successful is digital innovations in energy. Um, and that's why at the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, we are actually producing a new book uh, on digital innovation. Um, and, and let me give you a couple ways that digital innovations can help increase the penetration of solar energy. With that third thing, systemic innovation. What if? You know, solar is super unpredictable. What if we can predict it much better? Data science can enable us to forecast solar production. It can also enable us to forecast customer electricity demand, both in aggregate and at a very gradual level at different parts of the network with high accuracy, enabling us to better match up solar supply and customer demand. In addition, uh, data science can enable us to orchestrate a smart grid with a lot of devices at the edges in a much more efficient way than today's electricity systems can, such that that electricity system is super flexible. It's able to respond to uh, what the availability of supply is. Finally, um, I'll mention uh, an example not for solar, but for wind. 
data science can enable companies, uh, either makers of wind turbines or operators, to predictively maintain those wind turbines. They can say, oh my gosh, I think this wind turbine is going to fail based on you know, this, this pickup in the sensor data I'm getting from it. And before it fails catastrophically, you've got to replace the whole thing, you go in and you do a targeted fix. That enables you to get 10 or 20% more wind energy than you otherwise would. There are so many ways that data science can improve uh, the integration of renewable energy and increase renewable output. Um, I think that's a, a and, fertile field. And Presumably, a lot of those same techniques can improve the production efficiencies and lower the cost of the fuels solar competes with, yes. including oil and gas and coal. You can have way lower cost oil and gas supplies, thanks to advances, for example, in uh, 3D seismic mapping. Um, and and, and you know, but that enables you to your hydraulic fracturing to be more efficient. So you're right. Data is an equal opportunity for <laughs> lawyers. Um, and it's going to take public policy to set the incentives correctly. For example, we price carbon, you can bias the effect of digital innovations toward clean rather than dirty energy. Good. Well, it's a good thing we have the name word policy in our name. Excellent. We're studying the right things. Uh, so uh, if folks could come up to the microphone if you want to ask a question and just briefly um, introduce yourself. Uh, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Um, is this on? Yep. Okay. Hi, my name's Amr. I'm an undergrad in the engineering school at Columbia. Uh, I wanted to hear if you could say a little bit more about why exactly energy storage would only be able to account for 50% of the problem of value deflation in solar? So, it's a, it's a great question. And, and the, the statistic is that energy storage plus even flexible demand can only mitigate around 50% of value deflation. That's not a technical point. If you installed enough batteries, you could in fact mitigate all of the solar value deflation. It's a techno-economic point. Based on what's economical, to install with batteries, you can only install so many batteries that you're able to shift a fraction of solar electricity output. And if you're <coughs> shifting a fraction economically, and you're only shifting it for up to a couple hours, up to like four hours, well, then you're only going to mitigate some of the value of You're not going to mitigate them all. And where does that economic trade off arise from? It arises from the cost of the battery. The battery is free. You can deploy as much of it uh, as you want it. Entirely flatten that service value. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I upload the message. Uh, actually, I'm a fellow, actually, uh, advocate of solar and so on. And uh, about uh, 10 years ago, actually, we had a leading article in Scientific American uh, giving the case that uh, how solar. Uh, can, with other renewables, can produce 69% of electricity at cost uh, uh, competitively. And I will explain how. Actually, you had the points there, but I think you treated them separately. Uh, you show the grid. Obviously, the expansion of the grid is very, very important. Uh, getting from the high plains uh, wind uh, to the rest of the country, getting from the southwest to the rest of the country, 1.5 giga, 800 kilovolt, and so on. Technology exists. You don't need. You need just the right access and so on. And also the, the storage. But you mentioned battery only. And battery, of course, it is limited. It's not, even if it goes down to $150 per kilowatt hour, uh, it doesn't last so long. Maybe 5,000 cycles, and then it would be expensive. The case we made then uh, in 2008 was to use pump hydro or case, compressed air energy storage. So you have much cheaper, much cheaper actually. And we calculated that together with an expanded grid and with additional storage, long-term storage, we get actually the diurnal fluctuation. Because this, the cloud-induced fluctuation is not so expensive to treat. By having larger balancing areas, you would agree. You can have flexible, you can have wind and solar together. It's a very good synergy there. And you can have actually, when you have clouds in one area, you don't have in another area and so on. So it's a lot of really of smoothening by allowing, by the ISOs allowing, making the greater balancing areas. So again, I think that uh, that uh, actually roadblock may not happen at 30% or 20%. It may happen at maybe 6 or 7%. The 100% I agree with you is very aspirational. But I think it has a message. 
Because <coughs> if we think that we need to invest in all the options, we don't have the money for it. Yeah. I mean, do we invest more on pipelines on uh, or in electricity grid? We have to make a choice because we cannot both. Uh, we don't have the trillions of dollars. So I think <laughs> that Jacobs is actually target aspirationally, you know, uh, to show that it's as high as nuclear potentially or as coal. I think it's a healthy one, although I agree that it may not be cost competitive. So Thank my you. message is that just I give me a chance to respond. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so do you think that it could be really better? And maybe the technology improvement. You didn't mention that even if we. Uh, make it more efficient uh, solar cells. The balance of system cost. Right. So just, just I'll take that as a question. Um, the, you're absolutely right that uh, the solar panel itself is less than half of the cost of the total solar installation. So you might say, why on earth am I telling you about this more efficient solar coating uh, if that's less than half the cost of the, the total installation? How will that help the total cost of solar? Well, as it so happens, the more efficient your solar panel is, the, the lower your solar panel cost is, but also the less land you need, the less labor you need, the less equipment you need. Many of the costs of solar scale down the more efficient your technology is. I also think that as you have new form factors for solar, uh, for example, solar could be flexible, very lightweight. We could really cut down on many of the other associated costs with installing and deploying solar energy. So to answer your question, I, I do think that higher efficiency and more versatile solar materials could offer a big advantage. Um, on everything else you said, uh, I, I think you're pushing with the fire. I, I completely agree with you. I have nothing else to add other than to try and make a bad joke. I think you made a great case for compressed air energy. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there's another question, I think. <laughs> Hi. I, I also like a follow up to the law school here. Um, I want to pick up on the distributed uh, generation thread, and I wonder if you had thoughts on how change in technology might change that sweet spot you referred to. So with technology change, will we see a different spot? And relatedly, do you have different policy prescriptions for distributed or non-distributed, or is it so to speak, one size? That's a fantastic question. Um, I think that there could be technology uh, well, be better use of, frankly, existing technology um, might change the spectrum of where the sweet spot is between centralized and decentralized, and also change policy and market. On the technology side, <coughs> your rooftop solar panel comes with a smart inverter, which many do. It just connects your solar panel to the grid and converts direct current to uh, alternating current electricity. And that inverter responds to economic signals to provide certain ancillary services to your electricity grid. The frequency regulation when the sun's out, or at nighttime, voltage regulation for the provision of reactive power. This solar panel on your roof, even though it's super expensive to build, could actually be quite valuable, mm -hmm. providing a grid service to the local, possibly congested distribution grid. So that's a way that you could actually increase the value of very decentralized uh, solar installation. Um, I, I think it's an excellent question, but it does require um, some policy and regulatory changes. It requires us, for example, to offer very granular, temporally and geographically sensitive prices at every point in the distribution network. It requires us to have these decentralized markets for ancillary services. So there are a lot of like policy roadblocks uh, to getting to that future. But I think in that future, where we enable distributed energy resources to really show their full value, it could be the case that a very decentralized world is happening. Thanks for the question. Other questions? But I'm, I'm, while you're coming up, no, please come up. But I'm just, if you could um, just say a word about where you see around the world the fastest rates of solar growth are going to come from and what the drivers for that will be. Yeah. Um, I think the drivers fundamentally are going to be economic going forward. Previously, for where we are today, the drivers have been policy. Um, look, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to install solar in a country as cloudy as Seattle, Germany. <laughs> but Germany was an early leader in solar energy. Going forward, though, I expect economics to be the driver uh, of solar growth. Um, I expect you know, rapid growth in the Middle East. I expect rapid growth in, in India. India, by the way, is a combination of policy and economics. Uh, the cost of solar has dropped a lot in India. And in addition, the government has you know, provided decentralized options to get the market 
roll, the ball rolling. Um, and, and I hope the states pick up from them and continue uh, to hold auctions where the economics are quite compelling compared, especially to coal. Um, I do think in China, mandates will continue to drive the, the rate of solar growth. China's deployment of solar has been absolutely remarkable. And pure economics alone don't get you the way to stop. Um, but remarkably, almost every market around the world has great potential for solar. Latin America is about to come up. And the only laggard, frankly, is like Southeast Asia. And I think they're going to get their act together in the next decade or so, five years or so. So I think there is, there is hope and promise for every single market around the world for solar. Yeah. Yeah, please. Hi, uh, my name is Colin Brown. I work with the New York Power Authority. Oh, and yeah. uh, I'm just curious to, to hear a little bit, ask, ask you to dig a little bit deeper on the transmission roadblocks. Um, you know, New York experiences a lot of the regional congestion constraints, you know, very concentrated load, very you know, far flung uh, generation. So I'm just curious. What do role? What is the role of maybe like ISOs or RTOs? You know, we're all in ISO. We live in, in Kaiso. You know, these are very progressive and kind of balanced organizations. What? Who? Who <coughs> are the people or organizations that are going to blast through these sort of national uh, transmission roadblocks? It's such a good question. Um, you know, in an, in a harmonious utopia of a world, we would have uh, states in collaboration with ISOs, independent system operators that operate uniform groups, and the federal government through FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, all working together hand in hand to get long distance transmission lines that make a lot of sense permitted. The problem is that there are a lot of veto players. And those of you who are students of political science will know <laughs> that veto players can, can hold up uh, projects. For example, states often have veto rights over whether transmission lines pass through them and whether they're going to grant right of way um, and so we don't live in the harmonious utopia that, that we want. In addition, you often see opposition from groups that have very local concerns. They're worried about property value quality. They're worried about environmental consequences. Even though the overall aggregate societal benefits of long distance transmission lines are hard to argue with. Even transmission lines that bring hydro from Canada into the US, you know, very good economical way to, to power the United States grid clean energy. So going forward, if we don't have this harmonious utopia where everybody works together hand in hand, I wonder, and Jason and I have actually argued about this, I wonder if there is a role for a more muscular uh, federal policy on this. You know, FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, does have an order, I think you'll know this better than I do, Order 100, I think, um, it does have an order, 1000, where it, uh, it, it says, here's how long distance transmission permitting and planning has to go, and if they, you know, enforce that in a more muscular fashion and then allow the number of veto players to step up right now and prevent these projects uh, from taking place to do so, well, maybe we would have more success uh, in, in, in this process. I think it's a super important thing. The gentleman shared how if you're going to get to above a 60% share of renewables in this country, you need that long distance backup. I often hear people in the oil and gas industry complain about the Obama administration and their perception that it was constantly standing in the way of permitting oil and gas pipelines. And part of the answer I said is go talk to the people trying to build long distance transmission lines of solar and wind. They had a lot of complaints too. It's sometimes just the difficulty of a federal government bureaucracy and, and, and even within the federal government when you need a fish and wildlife permit or an Army Corps of Engineer permit to cross anything, it, it's complicated. Even, even when you have a president trying from the very top to really push these things through. Uh, there were two questions here, I think. Yeah, please. Um, Gabriel and Trevino sent me two mentors. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk and a fantastic panel Q&A. Uh, I'd like to ask you the question that you mentioned about big systems and regional systems. Can you comment a little bit about the possibility? If you have the right regional system uh, internationally, that you're able to cover night and day time differences so that you can have the supply point and the Vice versa from the demand. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's probably at the, at the edge of what's realistic. So I can definitely imagine a uh, cross continental regional transmission grid that enables you to time shift over a few hours. So one region is, you know, in the late afternoon and the other region is sitting down for dinner, and you're able to pipe solar electricity over from one region to another region that's demanding it. And that's how an east to west long distance transmission grid might help you uh, match up the fine demand. 
What the gentleman's asking about, though, is can we get solar electricity from the middle of the day to power a region that's in the middle of the night? That's going to require you to build a transmission network that goes around half the globe. And it's, it, in my opinion, uh, it, it's probably infeasible from a, a you know, it, it's expensive, it's technically difficult, but also, you know, geopolitically, do you really <laughs> want to depend on the guy who is diametrically opposite you? Like, who, who is that for us? That, that would be, like, China. Um, so, 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 so it's not clear that, that we want to be dependent on that person, um, uh, on that country. Um, yeah, that's a good point. It would really be somewhere in the middle of the ocean. Um, so, so I don't think that that scale of super grid is feasible. Now, the state grid of China does actually think it's feasible. Uh, and the head wrote a whole textbook, which I had the unfortunate misfortune of reading. Um, it is long, dry, and lays out the technical way to do this. But it's kind of under the same. Yeah. Global energy and internet. The, uh, the strategic electricity reserve we're going to have to build uh, next to the strategic petroleum reserve is going to be really big. Please. Uh, my name is Romeo, recent graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, two questions, really short. Uh, the first is, in what other industry have we seen value deflation and what can we learn from it, similar to how you pointed out nuclear um, uh, dealt with tech lock-in, how can we learn from another, another industry of value deflation? And the second is, uh, perovskite cells have a degradation problem. Solar panels often get deployed for 20 years or longer, and perovskite cells are known to degrade over time. Are there any recent advances that you can point out that are promising? Those are both amazing questions designed <laughs> to trip me up. Uh, so the, uh, I'll take the second question first, because I think it's a little easier. <laughs> perovskites indeed do degrade. And Early on in the development of perovskites, we had this fear that, in fact, exposure of perovskite solar cells to sunlight would cause them to be crazy. <laughs> that, is a, that would be an awful thing. Um, as it so turns out, when you remove the ingredient that causes that degradation from sunlight, um, they still are they're very vulnerable to moisture. You have to encapsulate perovskite materials uh, very well. Um, you're right. The current solar industry requires a 20 year warranty. If your perovskite can't last that long, you know, it may not make it in the market. And so that's why uh, the folks in Oxford Photovoltaic will start up commercializing the technology. The folks doing the perovskite on silicon layer, you know, they're hoping to piggyback not only on that silicon substrate, but also on the encapsulation techniques of the silicon solar industry, which are very good at keeping moisture out of the solar panel for 20 years. So I actually think that you know, if you keep moisture away, there are research reports showing several thousands of hours under stress tests of stress conditions of perovskite stability. Um, so, so I don't think there's an inherent stability problem anymore now that we got rid of the light soaking issue. The, this, the other question you raised, terrific question, is I gave you this analogy between nuclear technology lock-in and solar technology lock-in. So you're asking me, can I give you uh, an analogy between solar value deflation and industry X value deflation? And I will say, I don't have a perfect or winning response. I will say that value deflation is a generic phenomenon. Any product, the more of it you have, the less valuable it will become. That's a law of supply and demand. For solar, it's particularly pronounced because you only get solar electricity at a couple hours of the day. And so solar quickly cannibalizes its value. Now, a natural gas plant also cannibalizes its value. If you have a ton of natural gas plants, each of them is going to have, is going to be much less valuable. It'll be harder for them to raise revenue, power prices will go down. But power prices go down slower because natural gas plants can adjust and dispatch their output. For solar, it is pronounced. If you're really looking for an analogy, I'm going to try one based on the gas um, You can imagine that the emergence of shale gas uh, caused value deflation in the oil markets, where uh, shale oil caused value deflation in the oil markets, where you had a glut of new supply, uh, and that caused the price of oil to trade. That's True. Wrong. No, sure that's right. Okay. I mean, it wasn't the only factor, but probably the largest factor. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, are there any final uh, questions? Um, okay. Oh, last question. Hi, Owen Brady from National Grid. Uh, thank you very much for the book. I really enjoyed it. And I also appreciate your comment about pragmatism for the energy system, thinking about not striving towards a potentially unrealistic goal. And so my question, therefore, is 
talking in the book about how we would clean up the electricity grid and how we would make it more resilient. What do you think, in terms of sort of the lowest cost for decarbonization, you would suggest as the approach for looking at the residential sector? Would you suggest replacing all of home appliances and heating systems with uh, electrification, the beneficial electrification movement that we've seen? Or would you recommend utilizing the hydrogen and methanol creation with the carbon capture to leverage existing natural gas uh, assets, for instance, to allow homes to continue to heat themselves and, and, uh, and move towards those environmental goals while at the same time doing so in a way that is lower first cost potentially for homeowners? It's a terrific question. Uh, and it's one of those you know, fundamental platform questions that we have to make. Electrification is often held up um, by advocates of renewable energy as the obvious only solution. I think we've correctly shared an alternative um, I personally believe that electrification is the most compelling option. I think it should be a paramount policy goal, but we should also be very cognizant that we're not probably going to be able to electrify all the loads. You better think about alternatives um, for, for the loads that remain unelectrified. Um, for, 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 sorry, you know, heating demands that remain uh, unelectrified. Um, I think that the, the system we raise is, is an important uh, innovation. And there are many others. <coughs> so I'll, I'll end with a call for systems level research and institutions like this one. It's important not just to think about particular technologies, and I told you about many particular technologies, but it's important to think about how they all fit together. Now, we can talk about a fully electrified system, but that's only one of the possible end states for where we go, and it's probably not the one we're going to end up with. We're probably going to end up with a hybrid of an electrified system as well as what you mentioned, a system with hydrogen as many carriers, natural gas as many carriers. We're going to have to think hard about integrating these various different carriers into a system that works and is decarbonized at the lowest cost. And that requires a whole new interdisciplinary toolkit to what traditionally disciplinary pilots have worked on. And that's why I think your center is perfectly placed to do it. That's a good pr promotion. Uh, so, as I mentioned, this event, like all of our events, will be available uh, online and our pod pod uh, podcast on iTunes and Stitcher and your other podcast providers. Let me quickly mention the events we have coming up to promote further discussions. We talked a little bit about digitalization and what AI and machine learning and other things can do. The International Energy Agency just released a whole report on this, and Dave Turk from the IEA will be visiting us to talk about digitalization and what it means for the energy sector on April 4th uh, at 6 p.m. in Faculty House. Uh, a week later, on April 11th at 6 p.m., we'll be having a book talk and discussion about uh, Johannes Erpelinen's new book. He used to be a professor at Columbia and is now at Johns Hopkins SAIS about renewable energy and the politics of a global energy transition. And then on April 19th, uh, mm -hmm. for the afternoon from 12.30 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. is our <coughs> annual Global Energy Summit. Uh, with This is not a complete list, uh, but that will include the CEO of Conoco, the Deputy Energy Secretary, the Executive Director of the IEA, the CEO of SunPower, uh, the former Deputy Director of the CIA, the head of the Energy and Resources Institute of India, Dan Jurgen, uh, the former Chairman of Sinopec and CNUC, the former Special Assistant to the President for International Energy and Environment, and many more. So uh, as we do every year, that will be uh, the highlight uh, of the year. We have a pretty all-star team coming in uh, for a series of discussions and, and panel conversations. That's April 19th for the afternoon in Low Library. Uh, this was a tremendous conversation. It's a fantastic book, and it's really been a pleasure to have you here today. Please join me in thanking Varun.